this week. The question is, can there be trust? First, in the East, can we trust the Capitol security as the rebel second corps is within spitting distance of the White House? Can Davis trust Johnson, who does everything but win? Can Lincoln trust his cabinet? Can we trust those who promote peace but hold a dagger? July 9th, on Assassin, outside DC, Mayor General Wallace and Virgil and Ricketts have prepared themselves for battle. They number a mere 5,800, mostly raw men. And they're supposed to take on 14,000 experienced rebels under General Jubal early. An impossible task. But they are the only thing standing between the traitors and the capital. Frederick, Maryland. Jubal early watches as his men count out $200,000. He has ransomed the city as reparations. Their currency saved them a sacking. He can see the Union men holding the forts and roads to Washington. Are they invalids? Is it a whole Union Corps? He doesn't know, but it breeds caution in his heart. Georgetown Pike, 0900 hours. Virgil and Ricketts examines this section. The goal is to hold the roads to Washington for as long as possible. Sadly, being such a major city, it has many paths. He has 3,500 men, a majority of the force, and he will have to put it to the best use yet. For he sees Major General Stephen D. Ramsher and his rebel division coming his way. Baltimore Pike, Stone Bridge, for General Erastus B. Tyler. He hasn't seen action since Chancellorsville. What a last battle to have. He's alone further north than the main force, but his role is of great importance. He looks out and sees Confederate Commander Rhodes coming down. The men he commands may be raw, but hopefully the spirit of the country strengthens their arms. Frederick, early is getting custom reports, mostly from prisoners. Keep on saying the whole six corps here makes sense. This is the capital. They would have sent a corps to check his. He can beat a corps, but it will take time. Thomas Farm, the regiments of Ricketts are well situated. They can hear the sounds of battle, causing them to clench their rifles tight as they take cover along a fence. When they hear the sound of hooves, Confederate Cavalry Commander McCausland has been sent to take the left flank. He has ridden into a trap. One volley later, the secessionists are falling back. They rally, but are forced to retreat under immense fire. Back to Frederick. Early hears the disaster. This battle is a stalemate. Neither Rhodes nor Ramsher have made gains, so he sends in General John B. Gordon to destroy the pesky Ricketts. Under the immense fire from all along the line, our men break. Wallace tries to reinforce our artillery to keep from that bay. Thus, the retreat is ordered. Drums sound as men run for Baltimore. Tyler is left alone, though most of his men join the dash. By a final push at 1800 hours, we are forced from the field. 1,294 federal casualties, really lost between 700 and 900. And it's a terrible defeat for the rebellion. Outnumbered two to one, our men held enemy at bay against five different assaults for the whole day. Furthermore, the men of earlier are exhausted. Wallace and Ricketts bought time. Now, Wallace is replaced in overall command by Major General Ord, but this gets undone when it becomes known of his skills. If early had been but one day earlier, he might have entered the capital before the arrival of the reinforcements I had sent. General Wallace contributed on this occasion by the defeat of the troops under him. A greater benefit to the cause that often falls to the lot of the commander of an equal force to render by means of a victory. Some of the northern papers stated that between Saturday and Monday I could have entered the city, but on Saturday I was fighting at Monacy, 35 miles from Washington, a force which I could not leave in my rear. I was disposing of that force and moving as rapidly as it was possible for me to move. I did not arrive in front of the fortifications until afternoon on Monday. And then my troops were exhausted. July 11th, D.C. The citizens can see the enemy from their homes. Postmaster General Blair sees his ablaze. Despite the personal loss, the raiding of his estate did some good. It got the troops who found his whiskey hammered. Union troops marched through the city towards Fort Stevens in the north. Fort Stevens, 1,500 hours. The rebels begin the battle with skirmishing. It stays that way till 1,700 hours when a counterattack pushes back Confederate cavalry. Federal artillery bombards the suburbs, destroying the homes the secessionists take cover in. Rebels returning kind. President Lincoln and his wife ride to observe the battle. They are on the parapets when a surgeon next to him falls down wounded. Lincoln is ordered to take cover by uh, someone. Some of my sources say it's future Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. as a fact. Some say it with skepticism. Some say it's a lie, and it's instead right or some other soldier. The entire story is poorly documented. The 12th early decides Washington can't be taken without the destruction of his corps. Major, we didn't take Washington, but we scared Abe Lincoln like hell. The Union counterattacks and retakes the suburbs. The 13th early is marching back into Virginia. 
Just a brief detour. A story probably apocryphal, but too good not to tell, is of Ishmael Day, who when he heard of rebels marching through his town, decided to fly the biggest federal flag he had. And when Sergeant Field of the Secessionists tried to tear it down, he shot him with a shotgun, and then hit a baiting capture. It's probably not true, it's probably sourced, but it's too good not to talk about. That's that. DC is saved. Rebels squandered their chance to take it through fear, drinking, and a healthy bit of Union spirit. Unfortunately, Washington can't be saved from politics. The 9th, actually still vacationing outside of Columbia, Lincoln doesn't return until the 10th, he responds to Horace Greeley, who informed him of a possible peace delegation. Your letter of the 7th, with enclosures, received. If you can find any person, anywhere, your letter of the 7th, with enclosure, received. If you can find any person, anywhere, professing to have any proposition of Jefferson Davis in writing, for peace, embracing the restoration of the Union, and abandonment of slavery, whatever else it embraces, say to him he may come to me with you, and that if you really bring such proposition, he shall, at the least, have safe conduct, with the paper and without publicity, if he choose, to the point where you shall have met him, the same if there be two or more persons. Either they will accept the end of slavery and rejoining the Union, in which case, great, the question that split this nation is decided, or more likely they won't, and Lincoln can publicly declare he did try for peace. It's a win-win. Major John Hay, my private secretary, goes to New York upon public business of importance. I desire that all necessary facilities may be given to him in the matter of transportation. With that taken care of, there's a final issue on the president's mind, his cabinet. The removal of Secretary Chase has caused quite a ruckus. He needs to reassert his authority. I must myself be the judge how long to retain in and when to remove any of you from his position. It would greatly pay me to discover any of you endeavoring to procure another's removal or in any way to prejudice him before the public. Such endeavor would be a wrong to me and much worse a wrong to the country. My wish is that on this subject no remark be made or question asked by any of you here or else, now or hereafter. Let's start some miscellaneous fun with my home state of Missouri. For the controversial Battle of Camden Point, fought between Commander Fisk and some rebel regulars and mutineers. That's about what I know for certain. This battle broke me. I don't normally go through my research process, but I hope you enjoy this one. First, I looked it up, tried to find some online sources since this battle is too small for my books. The first one I find is a paranormal group trying to soothe ghosts. I went back to Wikipedia and looked at its sources. It has two. A newspaper article that I found of no use, and a great source, The Compendium by Frederick H. Dyer. This confused me because I'm used to The Compendium. It's great. But it's mostly tables, so I went through it. Yes, there is a battle on the 13th in Missouri. But the Wikipedia article says Fisk executed captured soldiers and murdered civilians. But I exhausted all of its sources, so I should have disregarded and given up. But I'm a Missourian, and this is a great claim. So I went through the article history until I found another source from the Missouri Historical Review. Bashi Bazooks and Rebels 2, Action at Camden Point, July 13th, 1864, by Scott A. Porter. A good name. I read through it, and I got what I wanted. The battle resulted in a massacre for the local area due to perceived Confederate sympathies. But by now, I was skeptical. And not just because it didn't mention the ghosts, which my first source found imperative. So I went through Mr. Porter's sources. The ones listed was an official communication instructing Fisk to not take prisoners, but that doesn't mean he executed or murdered. Next was the Annals of Platt County, which does mention executions, does mention murder, but the numbers don't add up. And the Annals don't seem reliable. The author is a hero who saves the Bible and others, and he's great, and a superhero. It just doesn't make sense. So what actually happened at Camden Point? Ghosts! Yeah, I have no idea. But these paranormal people were probably warning to the craziness of the battle. And no, there aren't ghosts. Now that I proved I actually do research, let's move on to a train crash. Shahola incident. The collision of a coal carry locomotive and a prisoner transferring one. Terrifying calamity I can't do justice to with my futile words. So I will instead let Frank Evans, a Union guard, speak for me. And it's graphic, so please skip it if vivid images of the dead are an issue for you. Certainly was a lot for me. The trains had come together with that deadly crash. The two locomotives were raised high in the air. 
face to face against each other like giants grappling. Tenderbar locomotive stood erect on one end. Engineer and fireman, poor fellows, who were buried beneath the wood it carried, preached on the weird up end of the tender, high above their rack. It's one of our guards sitting with his gun clutch in his hands. Dead! The front of our train was jammed into a space less than six feet. The two cars binding were almost as badly wrecked. Several cars in the rear of these were also heaped together. Their bodies impaled on iron rods and splintered beams. Headless trunks were mangled between the telescoped cars. From the rack of the head car, 37 prisoners were taken out dead. The engineer of our train was caught in the awful wreck of his engine. He was held in plain sight, with his back against the boiler. So he roasted to death. Frightful accident occurred 2 p.m. Friday, July 15th, 1864. The cause of the death was a drunken telegraph operator at Lackawaxon, Pennsylvania, four miles west of the scene of the disaster. The official report of the killed that were buried placed the number at 51, Confederate and 19 Union soldiers. From that horrifying image to the banal one at Petersburg, the 9th, as men dig beneath the earth to lay a mine under the enemy line, General George G. Meade orders advance lines to be dug. Bring the battle to the enemy. The 10th, Lieutenant General Grant finishes his supply center at City Point, begins the construction of rail lines around it. Clearly, he expects to be here for some time, with D.C. saved and Petersburg trying to... That leaves us with one final focus. Georgia. Last week, Davis lost faith in Johnston. This week starts with him sending General Preston Bragg to consult with Johnston. Nelson took over from Bragg. Is Bragg about to reclaim his command? Maybe, but probably not. For you see, Davis writes to Lee. At this point, General Robert might as well be the Secretary of War and the General-in-Chief, given his influence. Hood? John Bell has done good in this war. He won the Battle of Gaines Mill, saving Richmond with his brigade, a division commander he saw success at Antietam, fighting in the famed cornfield. In Gettysburg, he took the fight to the round top. Well, he's aggressive. That's probably why Davis wants him. General Johnston has failed, and there are strong indications that he will abandon Atlanta. He urges that prisoners should be removed immediately from Andersonville. It seems necessary to relieve him at once. Who should succeed him? What think you of Hood for the position? But he has quite the cost, and his leadership at a core level remains unseen by Lee. And it really has been disappointing. Telegram of today received. I regret the facts stated. The bad time to release the commander of an army situated as that of Tennessee. We may lose Atlanta and the army too. What is a bold fighter? I'm doubtful as to other qualities necessary. It seems Davis wants a grant. He thinks Hood the best option. But Lee said no, and Davis respects Lee. Right? General Bragg reached Atlanta this morning. Hope to hear from him as to affairs. It is a sad alternative, but the case seems hopeless in present hands. The means are surely adequate if properly employed, especially the cavalry forces, amply. So that's it. Davis wants a new commander. As commander-in-chief, he gets what he wants. But Hood? I don't think he's the right choice. Far too aggressive. But to be fair, what are the other options? Really only Lieutenant General Hardy, since Polk has been killed. In fact, Hardy is senior to Hood, so why not him? There is the aggressive factor, but also General Bragg, Davis's chief advisor, hates Hardy. For a good reason. And who hasn't been around in the West long enough to make many enemies? It also means he's not used to their style of combat. It's all very confusing, but if Davis makes a change, well, we'll have to wait till next week. That's the politics, but what are the facts on the ground? Justin holds at the Shoup line, staring down General Sherman. Near Sherman deploys a new knight. Mayor General Lovell Rousseau will lead a grand raid. Now, if you don't recognize that name, don't beat yourself up. He isn't in Sherman's Atlanta organization. If you're thinking, wait, the infantry division commander from Tullahoma? You are correct. So why would Sherman pick this man to lead a cavalry raid? Well, he is aggressive. The most common reason for promotion, it seems. So Rousseau leaves the district of Tennessee to burn down the rebellion. And he does. There isn't much more to it than that. His command takes care of the target railroad, unopposed. They burn down rebel infrastructure, supplies, and then return. It's a beautifully conducted campaign, but because of that, there isn't much else to say. And that's where the weekend, except it doesn't. We have one last loose end, and his name is Forrest. But this isn't a tale of his success, but his downfall. 
Nathan Bedford has a list of victories under his belt. Never mind they were against inexperienced recruits led by idiotic commanders, or that his tactics could be questioned in a court of law. He has a lot of support. But it seems he has run out of raw enemies and now has to face the battle-hardened men of Andrew Jackson Smith. His greatest victory happened a month ago at Bryce's Crossroads, and this sealed his fate. He has been chased by General Jackson Smith, who is protecting Sherman's rail supply. Horace has been ordered to wait until Lieutenant General 7 D. Lee can reinforce, so he bides his time in Okolona. Smith, preferring to fight Forrest before reinforcements, begins his march, but Lee gets there first, bringing the rebel numbers up to 8,000 against Smith's 14,000. You might think this disparity in number would unnerve the Confederates, but boldness and tenacity won them great victories before. Why not now? July 14th, outside Tupelo, General Lee watches as Forrest deploys his line, and Smith responds in kind. The Southern Cavalry moved forward, facing volleys and cannon shell as they advanced. The blue infantry form on the low ridges and deliver a fire their opponents aren't used to. In fact, this battle isn't what anyone expected. You might be wondering, who's in charge, Lee or Forrest? Well, both. Lee outranks Forrest for respects him, so he'd offered him command, but Forrest declined, but Forrest leaves the majority of the force, but he's under Lee. It's confusing. The in command is likewise a bit confused. General Smith is a fantastic commander, with a superb subordinate, General Mauer. Because of this trust, much of the tactical decisions will be made by Mauer, but Smith still is in charge. It's, again, only a bit confusing. What isn't confusing is the position. The early skirmishers of the secessionists are badly bloodied. The Union is only growing stronger. Artillery on lumbers and more regiments reinforce Mauer's right. His left is held by the United States Colored Troops, who are held in high esteem, allowing for more men to be diverted to the scene of battle without worrying about flanking maneuvers. When three brigades are sent against our men, they are shot to pieces. Their colors shredded, their horses massacred. The men that terrorized the peace now beg for it. Then in grand order we countercharge and sweep away the rebel assault. Colonel Bell leads Tennessees who want nothing more than glory. Building them are colored troops, men they hold in low esteem. An easy victory awaits. Black men will never beat white men. The 61st and 68th USCT hold their fire to at point blank range. They make the enemy pay for their ignorance. Bollies, not ragged fire, but organized battle turns the rebel raiders into corpses. The survivors are forced to take cover. Forrest rushes to rally them, calling off a planned assault. Lee takes a reserve division and tries to renew a charge. This revitalized assault suffers the same as those that tried before, and now we're orders in advance. 1100 hours, victory. The Confederates construct barriers anticipating the worst, but Smith doesn't attack. He he occupies Harrisburg, the nearby city, and tore up enemy rail lines. By nightfall, he takes stock of his supplies and decides, since he won, now would be a good time to fall back and refresh the ammunition and rations. He begins the march the 15th, trying to snatch victory from the jaws of defeat. Lee orders a pursuit, and Forrest agrees. As the Federals are crossing a creek, the rebels seize the opportunity and overtake the rear guard. Smith replies with cannon shot, panicking the steeds. He capture charges with three Federal brigades to two secessionists. It's got to be a hard fight for Forrest. Furthermore, his men are disorganized, trying to reassert order. Bedford rides, but he is wounded. So is Colonel McCall, his right-hand man. Command devolves to General Chalmers, who calls back the assault. He suffered 69 KIA and 533 WIA for 602 total. Rebels 215 KIA and another 1,925 wounded or missing for 1,340 total. Many fault Smith for not carrying up the assault on the 14th or the 15th, saying he could have destroyed Forrest, and he could have. But he's just staying to orders. He's there to protect rail lines. It's like being angry me didn't pursue Lee at Gaysburg. He still won. Forrest lost. Then there are Sickles, enjoying New Orleans, visiting the Governor Mansion, speaking to the Bar Association, and joining a ball with interracial dancing. That's where the week ends. Last week I said if you look deeply you can see how the war has changed. For the favor of freedom. This week it boiled to the surface. First DC is once again saved. And just think about how little there was to say. One year ago, my report lasted hours filled with panic and emotions, and this time around, it was even more desperate. But there wasn't the same panic. And of course, the Wizard of the Settle has lost. Horace, the Terror of Tennessee, is in an ambulance. That should keep us smiling till next week. Hi, it's the entire Sporty by Week team here, and I would just like to thank you all. This filming might seem a little bit off, um, outside circumstances from summer school, too. My very loud dogs had kind of rushed the filming, and I really do thank you for bearing with me 
I do hope to see you next week. Stay smiling.